science literally means knowledge. And so the attempt to get knowledge about the nature of the world around us and how folks have been doing this for many thousands of years, although it crystallized into the modern project of what we call contemporary science, maybe a few hundred years ago and uh, largely out of Europe. Uh, so these medicines uh, have a very, very long history of, of uh, shamanic use of various sorts in various cultures. Uh, and uh, the, the term shaman is something that comes from uh, the Central Asian language and uh, it refers to, to healers, to medicine people that worked with the, or still do work with the spirits of nature in some way. So shamans work with the, the energies and they call them spirits, whatever the word spirit is that translates into various different languages uh, in the sense that there's some, there's some beingness or some essence uh, uh, with all kinds of creatures in addition to humans, plants, animals, uh, even inanimate objects in nature uh, that the, the, the healing, the healers in these, very, in these societies communicate with in some way and use the energies of those, of those plants and animals and other objects to contribute usually to the greater good of their communities. You know, in general, uh, shamans are considered uh, of benefit to the societies promoting healing and, and uh, wellness and so forth. There are some uh, there are dark sides of the shamanic traditions as well with sorcery, sorcery of various kinds and so forth, but that's a lesser aspect compared to the, the benefits that they usually uh, confer to society. And all the indigenous traditions all around the planet, you know, have their shamanic components. Uh, and a lot of what we know about, say, psychedelic shamanism these days comes out of South America uh, Amazonia in, in particular and so forth. So beginning, uh, and even further back than that, you know, another aspect that is believed to have involved psychedelic medicine was from ancient Greece, uh, the Eleusinian mysteries, which arose sometime perhaps a thousand years BC, uh, or maybe even before that, uh, where there was this secret tradition uh, it was it was widely known and also secret at the same time as to what happened happened in the interior of these of these practices uh, that many of the especially the kind of more elite intellectual leadership as, uh, uh, components of the ancient Greek society would engage in this annual rite of communion of some kind with what is believed to be a concoction of, of uh, psychedelic plants that Albert Hoffman and others that I'll come back to later uh, consider to be something that's related to LSD, yeah, even a natural product related to that. So uh, there's all of this ancient history and it really was brought into the modern era largely in the 19th century by European anthropologists who were noticing the use of various powerful plant medicines by other cultures, largely in the Americas, in the Amazon, uh, with things like ayahuasca or in, uh, in, in Mexico and Central America with, with peyote and even up into North America by that time. And uh, tobacco as a powerful shamanic plant from South America, so that it was beginning to be documented by anthropologists. And then another pivotal event that happened at the end of the 19th century in, 18, in the 1890s in Germany was a chemist by the name of Arthur Hefter uh, identified for the first time the active, an active chemical substance from the, the peyote cactus and and named it mescaline. Uh, and that was the first example of a psychoactive, of a psychedelically psychoactive chemical substance that had been identified in nature. I mean, the term psychedelic wasn't around yet. Uh, people did not have a, an agreed upon term for this. Uh, one of the most interesting terms that was invented around that time, and then, but first really written about definitively in a book in 1924 by another German pharmacologist, Louis Lewin, uh, 
uh, was the term Fantastica. And he had a class of psychoactive substances that induced powerful alterations of consciousness, including the production of hallucinations and stuff. And he called them the fantastic members of the category Fantastica. I really like that name. And that's essentially, that overlaps a lot with what we now consider to be the psychedelics. Uh, but that word didn't come along until the 1950s. Um, so uh, Hefter was part of a tradition in German science in the 1800s of trying to identify chemical components from plants that accounted for their activity. It began 100 years earlier at the beginning of the 1800s when somebody identified uh, morphine from opium and then, and then a few years after that somebody else uh, caffeine from coffee, and then a few years after that, somebody else, nicotine from tobacco. And so there was this whole tradition of trying to reduce these powerful uh, plants uh, and their properties to one molecule. And, uh, and that, was, that was how, uh, that was kind of the, op the creation of the modern field of organic chemistry and natural products chemistry came from trying to identify active components to plants. So, in the early 20th century then, uh, other German pharmacologists, yeah, in particular folks like Heinrich Kluver and Louis Lewin were, were interested more in the properties of mescaline. They wrote about that. So there was, there was a little bit of a literature on psychedelic chemistry at the beginning of the 20th century, all in, all in German. Uh, and uh, the really opening of this area to the, uh, to the, to the English speaking world happened in a couple of ways. First, there was a ethnobotanist by the name of Richard Schultes, uh, who was a student at Harvard at that point. He was an undergraduate at Harvard, and then he got a PhD in Harvard in the late 1930s. Uh, and trying to, he had heard these rumors that there were these uh, psychoactive mushrooms in Mexico. Uh, so he went down to Mexico and he tried to locate, you know, some shamanic use of the mushrooms and he didn't have any success. It was kind of politically very, very dicey at that time. Uh, in Southern Mexico, there was a lot of revolutionary activity and he got caught up in some of that. And it was quite dangerous and he never really found any mushrooms, but he still wrote about it. So it was part of his PhD dissertation. Uh, there's a, another movie, if you have not seen it, which I also got the UC library to, to uh, to get access to. It's called em Embrace of the Serpent. And it's a uh, Colombian, it was made in Colombia by a Colombian filmmaker about four years ago. Uh, and it's, uh, it's great. It's a really kind of, I think it's a very beautiful, poetically beautiful and cinemagraphically beautiful story uh, about the indigenous peoples of the, of the Amazon. But in particular, it's told through a novelization of the diaries of two uh, of, a, of a German explorer from the early 20th century, and then Richard Schultes, uh, who was an American ethnobotanist uh, who went down there in the 1940s and 50s. And it's, so it's told through kind of uh, through their diaries. And then the novelization part is they're connecting with this indigenous Colombian Amazonian shaman uh, who at one point was much younger and then later is much older. And it's, it's really well done. So I recommend that to get a sense of sort of Amazonian uh, shamanic practice. So, uh, so, so Schultes began to kind of write about this stuff in the 30s and then later in the 40s, he spent many years, the first of probably 15 years of time spent in the Amazon uh, living with the indigenous peoples and learning about their shamanic practices with plant medicines like ayahuasca and so forth. Uh, and, but also hundreds of different medicinal plants that weren't psychoactive, you know, that had other kinds of interesting properties. So there was that. And then uh, in parallel in, in Switzerland in 1938, there was this chemist, Albert Hoffman uh, and Hoffman uh, was working at a pharmaceutical company called Sandoz, and he, uh, he was trying to investigate the development of new medicines uh, that were derivatives of a chemical called ergotamine, which was produced by a, a, a fungus that grew on grains of, of cereal grasses like rye or oats. And uh, 
uh, ergotamine is still used in medicine. It has powerful vasoconstrictive properties. It's good for treating migraine headaches, uh, but it's quite toxic. And, and, and his, uh, he was interested in trying to develop derivatives of it that were less toxic, but perhaps equally effective. And so he synthesized something that he called LSD, lysergic acid diethylamide in English, uh, lysergic sour uh, uh, diethylamide in German. Uh, and the um, uh, thinking it might be useful, it was tested by his colleagues in pharmacology and they said not useful. So he moved on to synthesize other derivatives, but for some reason, which he can never quite he was never able to quite fully articulate. Uh, he couldn't get this substance out of his mind. He thought that there was more going on to it than, than had been appreciated. So he resynthesized it in 1943 in the middle of World War II. And, uh, and at that point, he tested it on, his, on himself and found it, it discovered its powerful psychoactive effects and immediately got it that he had stumbled upon something uh, that was um, more powerful than anything else that had ever been investigated in pharmacology uh, and that was likely to have some benefit in, in the fields of psychiatry and psychology to, uh, to the psychotherapeutic process in some way yet to be determined. So this was 1943. Uh, he and his colleagues continued study of it in both humans and for its chemical properties and published a few papers and so forth. But at the same time, they started distributing it around. So if you were a, a bona fide medical researcher or a clinician or academic institution and you wanted to do study with uh, LSD, you could write to Sandoz and get some samples and they would send them to you. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> and that, that seeded many research projects that trying to investigate the possible benefits for clinical use and for science uh, that this powerful but mysterious substance might, might offer. So that was the 1940s into the 1950s um, and so forth. Um, at the same time, well, by the 1950s, uh, the United States Central Intelligence Agency and Army Intelligence Departments had gotten wind of this powerful substance. And of course, they immediately thought of Maybe it would have some nefarious uses as mind control, as a mind control tool or something like that. And they started developing these, these secret research projects where they were investigating the effects of primarily LSD because it was very powerful. Uh, mescaline was the only other psychedelic or that was the only other chemical known to be powerfully psychedelic at that time, but it was much less potent uh, than LSD. So it was a more efficient to work with LSD. So there were many studies going around that were funded by the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, but the ultimate goal of those studies was to figure out more about the properties of this substance uh, so as to use it for nefarious purposes. And there have been some interesting books written about that. Uh, there's a recent book called Poisoner in Chief, uh, which was uh, the story, the life story of a guy named Sidney Gottlieb. Sidney Gottlieb was the director of the mind control projects for the CIA. Uh, and the LSD project was just one of, of several ways of manipulating people and torturing them mentally and so forth. Just a very weird scenario. And interestingly, although much has been revealed about those programs the, from the 1950s, uh, through the Freedom of Information Act and journalists getting access to old materials and then writing about it. Uh, most of it we appreciate was destroyed uh, and the documents were shredded or they were redacted in a way that the original documents were all blacked out with marker pen. So they, they're, not, they're unreadable. So most of what and all the participants in those projects are now dead. Uh, so we'll never know. You know, we don't know. We're only, it's only the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's been revealed about all the nefarious things they did. Yeah. There was one thing where a guy named Frank Colson, uh, who was a chemist that worked for this project, uh, was having second thoughts about 
the sort of the ethics of what they were doing. Uh, and there's reason to believe he was he was murdered, uh, and uh, and then the uh, the the family, uh, particular a son of his, was uh, you know never let go of sort of looking into that. Uh, there was an apology that was delivered by the president, Jimmy Carter, at the time in 1970, in the 1970s, to the family. Uh, and then more recently, there if uh, there's a there's a mini series documentary on Netflix called Wormwood, by by uh, Errol Morris, the documentary filmmaker. Uh, some of you may know Hamilton Morris for his Vice series on uh, on psychoactive substances, but his father, Errol Morris, is a really uh, well-known documentary filmmaker who's done some amazing documentaries like The Fog of War on Robert McNamara and something on Rumsfeld. And he did this documentary on the Frank Olson story, uh, which is quite good. Uh, so recommend that. I can't get the library to get Netflix stuff. <laughs> so that takes us into the 1950s. So this is still not really part of the public eye yet. I mean, there's a science going on. There's a secret research program on the part of the uh, CIA. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of clinicians scattered around that are investigating these things uh, and some university programs. But uh, the, the larger public doesn't really know about this because they're not reading scientific papers and, and so forth. Um, and the, it really broke into public awareness in 1953 with Aldous Huxley's book on the, called The Doors of Perception. And uh, Aldous Huxley was already a pretty famous writer, mostly for his, his book, Brave New World. That was one of his first books that he wrote back in the 1930s. It's often read in, in high school now as the part of English classes and so forth. Uh, and it was back then as well. It's a rather dark novel about the future of humanity. Uh, and uh, Huxley had been introduced to mescaline. He, at that time, he was, he was originally from England, but he would, had resettled to Los Angeles, had lived there for a number of years. And, uh, and he was introduced to mescaline by uh, a couple of psychiatrists uh, Humphrey Osmond, who traveled to Los Angeles to give him the mescaline, but originally John Smithies. Uh, John Smithies was the last of this clan to actually uh, still be alive. He, he just died about a year and a half ago at the age of 96 or 97. He was living in San Diego at the time, and I had the pleasure of meeting him a number of times over the last 20 years and talking with him about some of this. But um, uh, Huxley and Smithies knew each other, and uh, in uh, 1950, uh, uh, Smithies and Osmond published a paper on a biochemical theory of schizophrenia, uh, and this was a really important paper in that it got people thinking about the, the possibility that uh, mental conditions like psychosis, schizophrenia, depression, manic depression and so forth might actually have chemical bases in the brain. And this, is, this was a new thing. You know, folks weren't thinking this way about that. And, and uh, Smithies had come up with this idea because he had had mescaline, uh, the psychedelic, and had noticed that some of the ways that he felt under the influence of mescaline seemed to be uh, similar to the way people who had psychotic conditions like schizophrenia described their, what they were experiencing. And so that got him more interested in thinking about what might be the chemical basis of things like that. And so they wrote a paper on that. Uh, Huxley had heard about that, was interested about the mescaline and, and managed to eventually then have an experience. Out of his one experience, he wrote a book uh, that really was the way that millions of people ultimately got introduced to the concept of, uh, of a powerful psychedelic substance. Again, the word psychedelic wasn't still, <clears throat> wasn't around then. Uh, at that point, this, these substances were called psychotomimetics because they, uh, in some people's eyes, they, uh, a prominent feature of what they did was to mimic something like psychosis, psychosis being a kind of disconnection from reality where one hallucinates or has um, uh, delusional experiences where they think things are happening that aren't happening and so forth. Um, 
Osman, the psychiatrist, <clears throat> uh, became very involved with the continued research of these substances and actually uh, maintained a friendship with Huxley and uh, correspondence with him. Uh, Osman was living in Canada, so was Smithies at the time, but then moved to Australia. Um, and uh, Osman moved, was in Canada for a number of years and then moved to the United States. And the uh, uh, Osman, though, and Huxley didn't like this word psychotomimetic, or they didn't like hallucinogen. Uh, they thought that those kinds of words did not capture what these substances did. So. Uh, they were searching around for another word, and Osmond pro proposed this word psychedelic uh, as mind revealing or mind manifesting, uh, and that and then wrote about that in the in the biomedical literature, and that word caught on, and so that's uh, even though other words are still used, most prominently hallucinogen is still used in a lot of especially more biomedical publications. Uh, some people use the word entheogen, which is also a fine word, uh, invoking or generating uh, the divinity uh, within. Uh, and, uh, uh, but psychedelic, I think, by far uh, captures the scope of the properties of this substance, because um, for me, at least, uh, the, the, the deep mate, nature of mind really is one and the same as the divinity. You know, there's a way in which our mind is, uh, is uh, in its greatest, most expanded capacity connected to everything else in the universe. Uh, and that is, you know, how, how I would conceptualize divinity as well. Something like that, of course. Now we're getting into very big, different kind of territory. Um, so... Uh, again, throughout the 1950s, as people were becoming more aware of this, there was another guy they, by the name of Gordon Wasson, who was a, he was actually a bank vice, vice president in New York, uh, but he had his hobby, uh, his real avocation was mushrooms. And he was not, not necessarily psychoactive mushrooms, but everything about mushrooms, uh, how how versatile they were in terms of being living beings that popped up everywhere uh, and how tasty some of them were, how toxic and dangerous uh, other ones were and so forth. Uh, his wife, Valentina, was originally from Russia, uh, from a culture that was very uh, familiar with and connected with the medicinal and culinary properties of the indigenous mushrooms where she came from. Uh, so they would travel around and visit various different countries and investigate mushrooms and so forth. And he, he happened upon uh, Schultes's PhD thesis from Harvard, uh, talking about these psychoactive, putative psychoactive mushrooms from Mexico, uh, which some people didn't think even existed. They thought it was a confusion with peyote uh, and other people thought, no, there's a distinct being, another being here, these mushroom beings that are, that are, that are what are being talking about. And that's what Schultes had thought, but he never found them. So Wasson thought, well, we'll give it a go. So he and his wife went down to uh, Oaxaca, Mexico, and they spent uh, a couple of years actually uh, looking around and eventually connected with a, a shaman, a practitioner uh, in that area by the name of Maria Sabina, uh, who offered to do this amazing thing. She offered to introduce them to the ceremonial use of this powerful psychoactive mushroom. And that was huge because this had been a secret practice for hundreds of years. Uh, when the when the European conquistadors came to Mexico and, and, and Latin America uh, in the 1500s, uh, they, they brought with them the, the very um, draconian kind of uh, processes of the, of the Holy Inquisition of the Catholic Church, uh, where it was deemed uh, heresy and witchcraft and and satanic kind of practice if, if you were engaged in these practices that were working with plant medicines or mushroom medicines and stuff like that. So if these kinds of things were found out, folks got into big trouble and sometimes were even executed. Uh, so everything went completely secret at that time uh, in the 1500s. And even though the early Spanish explorers actually wrote about 
you know, the indigenous use of mushrooms, it then disappeared completely. Uh, and so it was hundreds of years later uh, that this decision was made by this one person, Maria Sabina, to then reveal this practice to the modern world, knowing Wasson was very honest with her. He said, you know, I'm not going to keep the secret. I'm, I, I want to write about it and, and so forth. I want to take pictures. And she said, okay. Uh, and so uh, this ended up getting turned into a magazine story in what at that time was a major American magazine, Life magazine, read by a large number of of kind of regular old people in the United States uh, that then were introduced in this well illustrated story about these powerful mushrooms that altered consciousness in such a big way. This was 1957. So we have Huxley in 1953 with his widely read book and then Wasson in 1957. Okay. So that. Brings us uh, yeah. What was that? All right. I just said, could we take a quick question break? Right on. Uh, Delaney, you want to go? Uh, yeah, so someone in the class asked, um, at this time, like in the, the 50s, where everything they talk about is going on, um, what like the legal status of these substances were, and um, if there was any stigma at this point around them. Yeah, I'll do that for a while. Um, so the uh, uh, there was no legal status at all. Uh, the, the, the drug laws in the United States uh, have always been a real mishmash. And uh, this was especially the case prior to 1970 when there was a unified uh, set of laws passed that were called the Controlled Substances Act that we still have in place today. Uh, and uh, the, but in the 1950s, uh, many drugs that are considered regulated in, <clears throat> in some way or another now were completely unregulated. Uh, there were a handful of things that were regulated like uh, the opium type drugs and cocaine uh, and so forth. But most of the other stuff that are controlled substances now uh, were not regulated. And there were very few things that were illegal, kind of blatantly illegal. One of them was cannabis. Uh, and another one was uh, heroin. Uh, and that may have been the only two substances that were completely considered illegal in the 1950s. So drugs like LSD and mushrooms, even though at this point, the psychoactive component of mushrooms had not been identified, nobody knew about psilocybin yet, that, that's yet to come. Uh, and uh, mescaline, these, these did not have any illegal status or legal status. They were, just, they were just interesting, physiologically active chemicals that weren't regulated in any way whatsoever. Uh, so, yeah. Cool. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise their hand or just unmute. If not, we can keep going. Wait, sorry, can I ask? Um, I'm pretty sure you're, you might get to this later on, but um, you already kind of touched on it previously, but like, I was wondering how much um, you could tell us about how the history of Western psychedelic use has been influenced by like independent, or sorry, it has been influenced by or is independent from like traditional or indigenous or like ritual usage. Yeah, well, where, where we're headed kind of almost immediately is away from traditional usage. Uh, the, the, the reason I wanted to start with that is because I, I believe it's really important to appreciate that there are many centuries, if not millennia of uh, traditional usage. And a lot is known from, about these medicines from that very long period of kind of deep exploration by various different societies. But to the extent that th that has really played a direct role, very little of a direct role in, in what's going on today. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Onward. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just to round out now, you know, we're kind of coming up on the end of the 1950s. 
uh, folks are beginning to hear about this stuff. They're also hearing about LSD, uh, just kind of through the grapevine. It's not, it's not kind of big and nobody's written a book about it or a big magazine article about it yet, uh, some smaller articles. Uh, and um, however, there's a, there's a guy by the name of a very mysterious character by the name of Al Hubbard, uh, who gets wind of this back in the 1950s, presumably uh, through CIA connections. He may have even been part of that program. Al Hubbard is, is a really interesting character and a few people have written about him. Uh, Michael Pollan, when he uh, wrote his book on his, his recent book on psychedelics, got very interested in Al Hubbard. So he has a whole section uh, where he talks about what he could dig up about Al Hubbard's life. But he was a very uh, kind of mysterious character that, that claimed to have a background as a spy, um, as, a, as a financial wizard of various sorts. Uh, but he's most famous in this context for having really got excited about the therapeutic properties of LSD, uh, getting hold of a whole bunch of it from, from the Sandoz company uh, for, under some uh, story about doing research with it and then traveling around. He was also a pilot and he had his own airplane. Uh, and then he would fly around and he would visit various people that he thought would be important in terms of being able to develop more research and understanding of the therapeutic properties. And he would, he would uh, not only give them the LSD, but he would put them through a therapeutic session that he actually developed the parameters for. So he was one of the uh, uh, first people in Western, in, in American kind of work with this substance to develop the whole uh, understanding of the importance of so-called set and setting, of the what you're thinking about, how your mental space is, uh, what your capacity will be to tolerate all the uh, ups and downs of a session, and then the physical setting that you're in, uh, the use of kind of eye shades to uh, re remove any visual distractions or sound, music, and so forth. He developed all of these things as therapeutic tools, and he had no training in psychotherapy or anything like that. Uh, it's not clear what his training was in, actually. Um, and uh, so he ended up introducing a lot of people to this and starting some research projects. Uh, at one point, he introduced it to people in uh, and what we now know is Silicon Valley, but it was not Silicon Valley then. It was, I mean, this was the early 1960s by this point. Uh, there was pretty much nothing there except orange groves, uh, but there were some small engineering companies that were associated with Stanford University, and, and there were some researchers there uh, that he introduced to LSD and its effects, and they ended up developing some further research projects and so forth uh, in the early 1960s. So he was another vector by which uh, uh, knowledge about the powers of these medicines were getting out in, into the world. So meanwhile, uh, the, uh, uh, back to the mushroom story, there was another guy by the name of Timothy Leary. And so if you saw the movie, uh, you know uh, that Timothy Leary had, had a long and interesting complex trajectory. Uh, he was quite the character. I did not know him personally. I had the, I had the pleasure of meeting him once and I think maybe just a few months before he died. He was quite ill uh, at that point. Um, and, um, but he had, uh, as part of his trajectory, he had ended up in Berkeley for his uh, graduate work and got his PhD in clinical psychology at UC Berkeley in, in 1950, uh, and then uh, went on to start the psychological research branch of Kaiser, uh, the Kaiser uh, Medical Facility, which was headquartered in Oakland, uh, and did research there. He was very interested in personality, uh, kind of developing quantitative measures of personality uh, some of you may have taken the Introduction to Personality Theory class in psychology in the psychology department. I'm sure he's mentioned there as being one of the first people to think in a very quantitative way about how you could measure different kind of parameters of personality. He wrote a book on this in the 1950s, which was the first of its kind and got him some renown in the field. Yeah, he did a little teaching at UC Berkeley uh, part-time. 
uh, and then uh, he kind of uh, burned out on on things. His he had some traumatic things happen. His wife committed suicide. Uh, he um, and he ended up, you know, going off to Europe with his two kids at the time. Uh, spending some time in Italy, you know, he met somebody that was affiliated with Harvard University and personality research. He got an invitation to come there. Uh, and so he went to Harvard uh, and ended up in Harvard uh, in 1959, 1960 to do personality uh, science. Uh, right before that, right before he ended up at Harvard, uh, he heard about these psychoactive mushrooms in Mexico uh, that uh, had been written about in Life magazine by Wasson. Uh, that came to his attention. He went to Mexico, he ate some of these mushrooms, and he said, well, that's really interesting. You know, that's, uh, I'm, I'm a psychologist interested in the human mind. That's the most interesting thing I've ever experienced. Uh, I learned more in that one mushroom session than I learned in several years of study and reading about psychology. So, so in any case, he said, I'm going to study this. I need to study this as part of my research. So he went back to Harvard. At this point, Albert Hoffman, the guy who had discovered LSD and its effects uh, in 1943, uh, it was now 1960, uh, but in 1958-59, Hoffman discovered psilocybin as the active component of the psychoactive mushrooms from Mexico. He, in the same way, Sandoz made psilocybin available uh, for uh, research projects. And so Leary wrote to Sandoz, got samples of psilocybin and started the psilocybin project at Harvard uh, and trying to investigate the psychological effects of this powerful chemical. Uh, and he met another guy at Harvard by the name of Richard Alpert, uh, who was a young uh, psychologist, quite a bright guy who had gotten his PhD at Stanford and now was a, uh, a new faculty member at Harvard. Uh, and they connected and they developed this project together. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I, I didn't know Richard Alpert either. I did meet Ram Dass a couple of times, you know, and again, the, the last years of his life, you know, after he had his stroke, uh, so, so, you know, maybe the first time was 15 years ago and the second time 10 years ago or something like that. And Ram Dass died just last December uh, at, a, at the end of his late 80s. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the two of them had, oh, well, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, right. Ram Dass is what Richard Alpert became after he changed his name and I have, after a trip to India that, that is outlined in the movie, if you got to see that. Uh, the, uh, there was a graduate student at Harvard at that time in psychology by the name of Ralph Metzner, uh, who ended up working for, he, he appears briefly in the movie, he has a few words to say, uh, and uh, Ralph Metzner is somebody I knew well. So he, he, was, uh, he just died uh, last year uh, in his 80s, uh, but he lived in this area, he was a he was a clinician, but he was also a professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. So he and I were very good friends for 20 years. And so uh, I knew a lot, I know a lot of the stories of that era through him and, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so as you saw in the movie, uh, the, uh, the two of them developed this research project, but these are powerful substances. They, they get, uh, uh, they bring up all kinds, they manifest the mind. And the mind, we all know, is complicated. Uh, and it has, uh, there's a potential for all kinds of wild and crazy things to happen if the power of everything that can come up from the unconscious or that might be somewhat repressed or who knows what, uh, uh, isn't contained and guided and channeled in some way that can be therapeutically beneficial. Uh, which is what, of course, is one of the goals of contemporary when people talk about psychedelically assisted therapy, which I'm sure you'll hear more about at some point later in the semester. Uh, that is one of the main goals of those of that of that scenario is to create a context where uh, good stuff can happen rather than just random chaos. Uh, so, uh, but 
what happened at Harvard is more of the random chaos. And so it was too much for the structure of the university system to contain and they got booted out uh, and uh, took up a, a residence at a place in upstate New York called Millbrook and continued their research there and so forth. And that's, that's talked about some in the movie. So this was all happening, but uh, on the West Coast, you know, the, the, uh, the seeding that had happened from uh, say Al Hubbard in Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, even more interestingly, the CIA funded research projects that were going on in various places, uh, among which were the Veterans Hospital, the VA hospital next to Stanford in Menlo Park. Um, so at this hospital, uh, there happened to be a guy uh, living in the neighborhood by the name of Ken Kesey, uh, who was an author who had gone to Stanford to be a part of a journalism program there, a postgraduate journalism program. Uh, and at, he had also gotten a job working as a, uh, a psychiatric technician or assistant in the psychiatric hospital at the VA hospital in Menlo Park. And then he saw these posters advertising like, be a research subject in our project, you know, come in, we'll pay you $50, you know, we'll give you some drug. And then all you have to do is like sit in this room all day and answer some questions. So, and what they were giving was things like LSD and psilocybin and mescaline. So Kesey got exposed to all of these substances while he was working in the psych hospital. Uh, and out of all this came the book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest that some of you may have read uh, and also the movie that was made from the book. Uh, the movie's a great movie. The book is an amazing book, which takes you to places the movie can't go. Uh, so I, I highly recommend both. Uh, the, um, so Kesey though, uh, got so passionate about LSD uh, that he developed a whole series of events called acid tests, where they would rent these big spaces in the San Francisco Bay area, warehouses and so forth, uh, and make this big bowl of Kool-Aid type punch and put LSD in it. Uh, people knew that uh, and knew what they were signing on for, kind of. Uh, and then they would, uh, they would drink some of this stuff and, and they would stay there all night. And then they had some music going on. And the music was a, a band of musicians that had grown up in the Palo Alto area and they were called the Grateful Dead. Uh, so the Grateful Dead got their start being the band for this kind of series of events called the acid test. So a lot of people were learning about the powers of this substance through that. And then Kesey painted a bus. He and his comrades painted a, got an old, bought an old school bus, painted it with all kinds of wild and crazy colors. And then they drove around with that. And then they decided they were going to actually drive across the country to New York uh, and visit Timothy Leary and, and Richard Alpert at Millbrook, New York, which they did. Uh, and then, uh, but Leary didn't want anything to do with them. He thought they were like a bunch of nuts. And, and he, he thought his group was trying to do serious academic science here. And these folks were a disservice to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the reputation of what these chemicals might be researched for or something like that. So there's a lot of action now in the 1960s, which continued to percolate out into the wider public. Many people started hearing about these things, wanted to have X, what's going on. We want to have access to that ourselves. So, uh, so there needed to be, you know, Sandoz decided beginning, was beginning to decide around 1965 or so, this is too crazy. We can't be providing LSD for research anymore. It's, it's, it's getting too much of a, of a complicated reputation. So they stopped providing it. So there had to be other sources of, uh, of, uh, uh, of supply to, uh, to generate the materials for things like acid tests and other sorts of scenario. So various chemists sprung up, a number of them in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, one of the most, there were a number, actually several of prominent chemists back in the 1960s, but most of them uh, did not develop any public reputations but several did. One was uh, Stanley Owsley, August, Augustus Stanley Owsley. Uh, Owsley famously 
lived in Berkeley for a while. Uh, he had a girlfriend who was a chemistry student uh, who, and the two of them figured out how to make LSD. And then Owsley, uh, over a period of a couple of years, made millions of doses of LSD and that was distributed widely um, and uh, largely from laboratories here in Berkeley and Richmond and later Orinda. Uh, so uh, Owsley trained other people uh, and uh, Tim Scully, Nick Sands, and uh, they went on to you know, make a lot more uh, over the years. Uh, there have been several books re re written recently about Owsley's life and, and so forth. And uh, uh, Sand recently died. Scully's the only one that's, that's still around. And he's kind of a, a reclusive kind of guy. Uh, Sand was very interesting. He was, uh, uh, I got to meet him a number of times. He died about three years ago, but uh, he had been arrested maybe in the 1970s. But then he escaped. <laughs> he escaped, and he was he was out there for 20 years, you know, continuing to make LSD. And then uh, uh, they caught him again, and he ended up being in jail for just a couple of years or something before he was able to get out again. And then uh, he was going to write up some life story, but I don't know how far it ever got. But but there was a documentary movie made on him called. Uh, I think it's called the Sunshine Makers. I'll make sure I get the Sunshine Makers. Yes, uh, which is quite good. Uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, they 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 had a premiere showing of that documentary at a psychedelic science conference in Oakland, in maybe it was 2017. And Nick Sand was there. I was there, and he was there. So I got to see him then. And then two days later, he died. You know, so it was really. Uh, nice that he was able to see that movie as one of the last things uh, in his life. So we're now in the 1960s, let's say the later 1960s. Uh, now the government is starting to get worried because too many people are taking this and having powerful experiences. And all of this politically got wrapped up with the very huge concern about the escalating war in Southeast Asia, the, the Vietnam War, uh, that was much more of an issue to college age students at that point, because there was a draft, there was a military draft. Uh, and uh, once, if you, were a, if you were a man, if you were a male and you were 18, you became subject to the draft. That is, you were gonna, be, you were gonna have to go to the military. And, and do a stint in the military. Uh, and at that point, it meant very likely you'd be going to Southeast Asia and at least shooting at people and maybe getting shot yourself for a war that people were more and more concerned was a, a complete act of nonsense, if not, uh, and so forth. Uh, and, and all of this was being wrapped, was wrapped together with the use of psychedelics with the other activism uh, largely emerging from folks of your generation, of college generation, from college campuses. Berkeley was an epicenter, the civil rights movement, uh, uh, the, 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 the equality for, for women movement. Uh, all of this stuff was huge. Then the free speech movement out of, out of UC Berkeley was all wrapped up with psychedelics and, and even cannabis, uh, all of that. Uh, and it contributed more than anything else to a complete kind of making everything illegal, uh, which began in California in 1967, 66, 67, uh, and then went to the federal level by 68 and got locked in with the Controlled Substance Act in 1970, uh, where everything was then shut down. There was no more legal availability of any kind. All the research programs had to close because they no longer had any legal access or approval uh, for doing these kinds of projects. And also there began to be a, a real concern on the part of many people that maybe these really were too dangerous for any kind of uh, uh, useful application in, in society. So Any, uh, any, uh, is this a good point for a break before I, then I'm going to jump ahead to the modern era 
but I won't say too much about that because I think you'll have a lot more to say about about that in the coming weeks. Yeah, um, there's a question from Annabelle. Do you want to ask it or do you want me to? I'll ask it. Okay. Um, so I was just going to ask, um, would you say that the barring of the acid tests and the sort of stigma around that is what caused the stigma further around psychedelics? And probably what eventually led to the laws of I think I think it's not possible to say one thing led to another. It's like everything was happening at once. I'm not sure that the acid tests were any more uh, kind of targeted in some way than other sorts of activism movements that were coming out of college campuses at Berkeley and elsewhere uh, that that seemed to be in many people's eyes tied to the use of psychedelics and cannabis and so forth. Uh, so it was that constellation of all these different kinds of activism, really, and the kinds of thinking that was so, that were so um, kind of exemplified. I mean, Leary became, eventually became a lightning rod because he, he really articulated a feeling that a lot of people had about a real discomfort with the status quo and sort of the, the military corporate oligarchy that was more, getting more and more, uh, more and more power uh, in kind of controlling the direction of society. And that was more than 50 years ago. And I mean, I can only say it's gotten way worse since then in terms of the, you know, the powerful juggernaut of the, of the military corporate oligarchy. Uh, and, and so, uh, but of course, who's running things? Who's running things is the military corporate oligarchy. So uh, they're not very happy to see this kind of opposition that's kind of boiling up from the populace, especially the younger components of the populace. And so there was a, there was a lot of pressure to put the lid on that, which is I think what led to the, to the, uh, uh, to the completely uh, illegal status of all these substances coming about relatively quickly. Cool. Um, I also see that um, Shear has his hand raised. Do you want to? Do you want to ask a question, Shear? Cool. Yes, I have a question. Um, do you feel that the current momentum in terms of psychedelic science is reactionary to? the, I guess, process that people in the 60s and 70s uh, tried to like popularize. And what, what I'm asking is, is this the way that we are, is this the best way going forward to study it in a clinical setting rather than put value on, <laughs> sorry, there's sirens going on in the background. Um, putting value on the clinical studying of psychedelics rather than uh, putting a larger cultural weight on it. Um, is that like a reactionary thing, like a more reductionist approach versus something that's more philosophical and like renegade? Well, I don't think it's a reaction. I think, I think it's a, it's a um, thoughtful approach, let's put it that way. Uh, in the sense that there is powerful clinical utility. I mean, that's that that is that was a, that has basically been appreciated as part of the shamanic cultures because they use these these medicines as therapeutic tools. Uh, and uh, and uh, very early on in the research of the 1950s and 60s that was going on in medical centers and hospitals, they appreciated. The therapeutic utility they did. There were lots of studies done on addiction, uh, on the treatment of anxiety, on helping people, especially with the anxiety related to dying, if having a diagnosis of a terminal illness, and how to kind of manage the anxiety around that and become comfortable with their trajectory in, in one way or another. So it's been appreciated for a long time that these were powerful aspects of how these tools could be really helpful, how these medicines could be really helpful for folks who are suffering uh, in various ways. So it makes sense to take that as a path of development. And it also is one that has a straightforward 
um, clinical kind of program uh, that one has to satisfy in order to demonstrate that with certain kinds of controlled studies and so forth. So it, it, it's a very reasonable way to go. The other thing that one learned from the 1960s, say, is that even though a lot of interesting beneficial things came from a more widespread use of these substances, and one can say that a lot of sort of aspects of the music that grew out of that era that became that so inspirational for many people and became inspirations for a lot of contemporary music, you know, the great musicians of the day, of those days, Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and, and uh, the Rolling Stones. And I mean, all of these folks were, were heavily influenced by psychedelics. Uh, and, um, but despite all that, there was also, uh, there was an appreciation of the power of these substances to manifest the psyche in a way that one really needs to be careful about that. And one really, because there is downside, you know, people do have psychotic breaks that they never come back from. Uh, and so it makes a lot of sense to approach this thoughtfully with as much education and as, as much guidance and, as, and a lot of attention to containing and guiding whatever manifests. And so, and that can only be done with some degree of thoughtful preparation. Again, in the shamanic cultures that use these things, they're never used in a kind of random open way. They're always used embedded in a very, very powerful ritual structure under the guidance of shamans uh, that, that, have, that take responsibility for making sure that things go as well as possible. Cool. Um, we have a, oh, sorry, we have a, two more questions. One from Brandon. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering, did Tim Leary ever change his mind about like uh, thinking that Ken Kesey and like the more casual users of psychedelics were like a bad influence or did he keep pretty firm on that throughout the rest of his life? No, he was not. He did not stay firm on that. And, and uh, that's where he was at that time. Uh, my understanding is, I mean, once so early on, my understanding is that, I mean, first of all, Kesey was a very complicated character. And even though there have been several biographies written about him, um, uh, there has not been a, a really definitive one yet, in my opinion. Uh, there's still good good scholarship waiting to be done on Leary's life and his contributions, which is why I wrote that essay when the New York Public Library acquired his archives, because it makes them available for future use for, for historians. Um, and uh, because, you know, although Kesey started out as a really kind of academic operating under a lot of constraints that were self-imposed by himself around trying to contain these things, uh, once he realized that the government was not on his side, you know, you know, he was, you saw his testimony in Congress about how he wanted to see kind of a regulatory approach to, if you saw the movie, to psychedelic medicines and so forth. But once he appreciated that they were not gonna go along with this, you know, they were gonna like stamp this out at all, at all costs, he kind of changed his mind and started to say, okay, you know, then if, if that's the case, then I need to be more of a proselytizer or something like that. So he was, you know, he was a very, he was a guy, I called him a, he was a trickster. He was a coyote. He was always kind of changing directions and shaking things up in some way and so forth. Um, so I don't, and, and, and again, according to the people that knew him well, that I knew, uh, the people that I know that knew him, he was a very, even though he had, a, he had many flaws, you know, he had difficulty with human relationship and so forth, and it went through a number of marriages and uh, a suicide of a, of a wife and a suicide of a daughter. I mean, that's something's messed up there, you know, in, in all of that turmoil. At the same time, uh, the folks that knew him said that he didn't have a mean bone in his body, you know, that he, was, he really uh, liked everyone. Uh, even though he had difficult time with many relationships and so forth. Um, oh, oh, yeah, we have one more question from Core. Uh, 
Uh, hi. So, um, so you talked a bit about how like um, psychedelic drugs were outlawed, uh, outlawed uh, in part because the government was just scared of activism being tied to psychedelics, but also in large part, psychedelics were outlawed because people like Timothy Leary and Ken Kesey were um, distributing LSD in kind of a undisciplined way, kind of chaotic. Uh, kind of chaotic way. So I don't want to say simplistically like who's to blame, but do you think one side bears more of the responsibility for the stigmatization of psychedelics? Um, yeah, well, first of all, let me just make some corrections there. Timothy Leary never distributed LSD in any kind of chaotic way. I mean, his- so Yeah, sorry, uh, like- Talked about using Yeah, it. talked about it, yeah, yeah. Promoted, maybe irresponsibly. And then Kesey did distribute some through the acid test, but compared to the access that people had shortly after that, uh, more, more, way more pervasively, you know, they're, they're minor players in any kind of distribution. So although many, you know, reasonable people disagree about these things, and it's very uh, conventional to, to target Leary uh, and other, a few other individuals, I really don't think it makes a difference. I think if Leary had not existed or Kim Kesey had not existed, we would still have the, had the same scenario uh, that the kind of the power of these medicines would have gotten out because of the constellation of events that were happening at that time with the civil rights movement, the free speech movement, uh, the war, uh, there would have been the same kind of activism uh, and it all would have gotten entwined together and the same thing would have happened. Uh, so I, I think the long arc, the momentum of the historical forces that were operating at that time uh, set it up such that this was the inevitable outcome. Thank you. So um, you, uh, you said that you have a, a little bit more prepared before we get into a larger, a larger discussion. Uh, Okay. Um, yeah, so let, let's, uh, if it's all right with everybody, let's uh, hold the rest of the questions for um, until the end of the, the talk. Okay, well, I, I don't have anything prepared, but I thought it would be good to kind of bring us up to the present. So, so I, I'll just, so here we are in 1970, everything's illegal. All the mainstream research is shut down. I should mention a couple of other things. I mentioned all of the research that had happened in the 50s and 60s at, at institutions, medical, biomedical institutions around addiction, uh, anxiety, you know, the treatment of the death process, working with depression, even psychosis in some cases. So there was a lot of exploration of this. Uh, and uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, Leary and his colleagues at Harvard were doing some other kinds of very innovative studies. Uh, one very famous study where they, uh, that came to be called the Good Friday Experiment, uh, where they gave psilocybin uh, to a bunch of uh, uh, graduate students in theology uh, that were associated not with Harvard Divinity School, but with, uh, I think, another divinity school in Boston. Uh, and uh, and then they went to the church service on this very holy holiday in Christianity uh, and had these powerful mystical spiritual experiences if they were, uh, if they were part of the psilocybin group. And there was also a placebo group uh, where they, you know, they said, oh, that was a really good sermon, but I, you know, there was no very kind of life transforming mystical experience that came out of it. So that they did that, uh, there was a version of that kind of experiment that was replicated more recently at Johns Hopkins in 2006 that I'm sure you'll hear more about. Uh, so, uh, and they also uh, gave, they went into prisons, they, they sat with prisoners uh, and uh, guided them through LSD sessions, uh, hoping that it might have some beneficial impact on improving their uh, success after, after uh, being released. Uh, in terms of reintegrating into society and so forth. That was very unclear about whether that led to benefits, but it was also clear uh, that they didn't fully appreciate 
at that point, <clears throat> or perhaps appreciated very little uh, about the importance of what we now call integration. That is the, the, the continuing work on whatever the processes were that may have been initially catalyzed by the experience with the psychedelic medicine. It's not just a one-off. It's like you take this and everything is fixed. It's like you take this, it opens things up, and then there needs to be continuing work that may last a lifetime, really, to draw upon whatever, uh, wh whatever the initial uh, developments that came through the experience were. Uh, and they didn't appreciate that. And so that confounded their capacity to really kind of get the most from whatever the effects of the medicines were. Um, so this was happening in 1970, everything ended. Uh, so-called recreational use never went away. I mean, there was always availability in the illicit market of mushrooms that people grew, of LSD that chemists synthesized and so forth. And so there was a rather constant prevalence of use as measured by the surveys that uh, have collected use data uh, uh, for the last several decades uh, that that continued all during this period of illegality of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, into the 2000s, and right up to the present time. It's really not changed much in terms of the kind of prevalence of use of, of, uh, of compounds that are so-called classical psychedelics, things like well, most commonly LSD and mushrooms. People don't have access usually to psilocybin. Uh, so it's the, it's the psilocybin mushrooms themselves. Um, so. Uh, but what did change, of course, is there was no more legitimate research, and that, that really did end. Uh, however, there was always a, uh, a hope among the folks that knew about that, that had either been part of it back then, uh, that, have, that are still alive, you know, people like Bill Richards at Johns Hopkins and Stan Groff. Uh, uh, there was always a hope that there would be uh, uh, the capacity to bring this back into legitimacy as a, as a tool that would be helpful for the relief of suffering uh, in therapeutic contexts and for further deepening explorations of the nature of mind as a, as a, as a research project in biological psychology. So uh, concerted efforts to bring that about really didn't get started until the mid 1980s. And in the mid 1980s, a guy named Rick Doblin uh, started, whose you know, article I think you had suggested to you at one point, started the, uh, the MAPS, you know, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And MAPS had one purpose, you know, was to bring back kind of legitimacy to psychedelics as a therapeutic tool and in particular, we're going to focus, MAPS was going to focus on this one compound, uh, MDMA, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, which was a new substance uh, that had been uh, synthesized and characterized by a local chemist, another UC Berkeley graduate, uh, Alexander Shulgin, that I've also written about, and you can look up my essays on him, uh, who was a very good friend of mine uh, during uh, his, the last 20 years of his life. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, the, it says the MDMA has very different properties from LSD or psilocybin or mescaline. You'll hear more about it, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, some people don't even consider it a psychedelic, but I choose to put it into that category simply because it, it does have mind manifesting qualities, although they manifest much differently than for the so-called classical psychedelics. So, uh, and MAPS, really had this goal of bringing MDMA into uh, legitimacy for therapeutic research and more widely other psychedelics as well. In fact, the first project that MAPS, uh, MAPS sponsored to get off the ground studying psychedelics again in humans was a study with DMT uh, by, by Rick Strassman, a, a psychiatry professor at the University of New Mexico at the time. Uh, who did the first human research with a psychedelic substance since the 1960s, uh, first legit, I mean, government approved human research. Uh, and it took several years to get all that approval process in place. Uh, and then he gave these doses of DMT and, and under hospital conditions and at the University of New Mexico Medical School and published a series of papers on it. 
uh, in, the 19, in 1994. Um, later wrote a book called DMT, The Spirit Molecule, which later became a movie uh, that some of you may have seen. Uh, so, um, and that was really the first project. And then uh, after that, in the 1990s, uh, the first early work with MDMA was done by Charlie Grobe at uh, the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA Medical School. Uh, and then Charlie Grobe did the first work with psilocybin uh, in the treatment of terminal cancer patients. And so now we're up to 2000 now, only 20 years ago, about the time you guys were born, some of you. Uh, and uh, then uh, at that point, other folks started getting into the game. That At that point, it became clear that the momentum is increasing here. It's possible to do research again. You just have to jump through the hoops, do all the paperwork, uh, get the licenses, uh, and uh, make sure everything is well-documented, and in particular at that point, it became convenient to study patients that were suffering from some condition because that made it a, a bit more straightforward to actually get the kind of approval process in place and so forth from the Food and Drug Administration, from the Drug Enforcement Administration, and so forth. And so it was decided to focus on terminal cancer patients that had anxiety uh, for, psilocy for psilocybin, and projects were set up following Charlie Grobe's uh, pioneering uh, of this at UCLA. Projects were set up at, at New York University and at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and then uh, MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder for this serious condition of anxiety secondary to trauma um, associated with you know, severe physical or emotional trauma in someone's life. And so those have been the, the two major directions that have been explored now for the last 20 years. And now people are bringing, are bringing in other things as well. The study of addiction again, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and then the basic science around, well, what's happening in the brain? You know, what happens, what can we discern from brain imaging technology and so forth about uh, what these substances are doing and how might we then speculate on their mechanisms of action and so forth. What are they doing at the neural synaptic level? Uh, it's been known for a number of years that, that they interact largely with serotonin using neural systems. Uh, the classical psychedelics are agonists or activators of a particular kind of serotonin receptor, the 2A receptor. Uh, what can that tell us about the uh, deepening our understanding of the mechanism? And that's kind of where we're at today. It now is very straightforward actually. Uh, in many scenarios, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not at all difficult to get permission to do uh, basic science and clinical studies with these compounds, although they remain illegal. You know, they all still are Schedule One controlled substances, and you have to go through a bunch of steps to get approval, but you can do it if you're a legitimate institution and you take the time uh, to do all the paperwork and, and so forth and provide all the assurances of safety because these are very powerful. So, I mean, I'm a champion of doing this carefully uh, because they are so powerful and because they evoke so much, uh, it behooves us to uh, develop and maintain a high level of respect uh, for that power and how to, uh, how to guide it in a way that's of most benefit to, uh, to everyone. So that's uh, probably a good place to stop in terms of my kind of arc of describing the arc of history with my focus on a lot of the earlier stuff because you may not hear that you know, from anyone else and, and you're, some of the other folks will speak to the much more recent stuff. Oh, if you three have any more uh, questions that you wanna ask, I wanna open the floor to you guys first. Um, one question we had is, uh, right now we've been hearing the, the term psychedelic renaissance being thrown out a lot, a second psychedelic renaissance. So given your uh, historical perspective, would you say this is an accurate term? Well, it's not an inaccurate term. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I, I personally don't use it uh, and because I feel like these medicines have always been around, they've always been used, even though there is a a flowering now of the uh, of the research uh, 
uh, and the acceptance of the research in a way which is which is a real kind of step change from what it had been. So in that sense, it's not an inaccurate term, but I, I always like to draw attention to the long arc of history uh, of these substances. Uh, another one we had was, would you say that the psychedelic research today encounters more or less stigma than it did back when it was first popularized in the 60s? Well, um, the the psychedelic research really, yeah, in the 60s, nobody had heard of it yet. So it was, so in the early days of the research, you know, the, of the academic and institutionalized biomedical and psychological research, these were all, this was a very new thing. And it was just like, wow, this is really interesting. And it's doing something powerful to the biology and the psyche, and we should study this more. And there really wasn't any, any place for any stigma to be coming from until it got to be widely utilized and associated with all of the kind of activist movements that we were talking about and, uh, and caused the problems that it did cause in some people's lives that then got very much amplified by the media. Uh, and uh, so then there was a reason to stigmatize it. Uh, so then in the current research, what people no, I mean, either they remember that era if they happen to be alive then, or they've read about it, uh, and they uh, then may acquire this kind of stigmatized way of looking at it because of, of the widespread attention to the potential kind of downsides of it that got that talked about a lot in the culture that, that led to it being made illegal. I mean, the fact that <clears throat> that Timothy Leary, because of his advocacy of psychedelics, was, caught, was called supposedly, although it's never been, uh, it was apparently a private meeting, so I've never been able to get a actual source for it, but it's called by President Nixon at the time, the most dangerous man in America, <laughs> that you could say that about somebody who's, whose crime was promoting the use of a so-called mind-expanding chemical I mean, <clears throat> that's quite a level, it's quite a high level endorsement of some kind of uh, stigmatization. Uh, and that he was given draconian prison sentences of 30 years uh, for the possession of a very small amount of cannabis. I mean, that's just completely insane and, and out of line. And so that sort of stigma has carried through in a kind of subconscious way to modern times. So that was part of the the stigma that the modern research was dealing with. So when when these when the when researching the substance these substances first began to be floated, uh, <clears throat> it was not looked upon favorably by a lot of institutions, uh, and uh, the idea of actually researching it, you know, maybe this would be interesting, but we don't want it at our university. You know, look what happened at Harvard in 1963 and stuff like that. Uh, you heard a lot of that. So the the folks that were that were the pioneers in restarting this, like Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico and Charlie Grobe at UCLA, you know, they really had to <clears throat> kind of deal with that and, and work with their institutions to, to make it okay to carry out the research. Uh, and uh, now that's of course, because it's gotten such positive media attention because of all the positive results that have come out from the clinical trials and so forth, there's uh, much less, there's a decreasing stigmatization now that folks are, 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 uh, are seeing. And then books like Michael Pollan's book, which was a, uh, because it was a bestseller, you know, he has a, a very high profile as, a, as, as an extremely good journalist, which he is, uh, and did such a good job of portraying that story uh, that gives it more credibility. So the stigma is definitely uh, decreasing today. I mean, it could be, you know, I can remember now, I can remember 15 years ago, I remember there was some guy giving a talk here in, in molecular biology uh, who studied serotonin uh, and made some allusion to having got, gotten excited about this when he heard about its connection to psychedelics and and people in the audience like just laughed 
you know, it's like, ha, huh. <laughs> you know, I mean, who would, who would be so silly as to study those things or something like that. Uh, and now, of course, things have shifted and, and many people would like to uh, get involved with this kind of research because it is very exciting and it does open up whole new scenarios for deepening our understanding of the mind and the mind-brain connection. Yeah, thank you so much for that um, in-depth response. Um, it definitely covered like most of the questions um, or like some of the questions that we did have. Uh, but I guess as a follow-up to your closing statement about like our, the current state of the research being um, just like more important for the future, um, could you like expand on that? Just like, why do you believe uh, studying psychedelic substances without like um, bias or uh, like, un, un, like having the understanding of what's happened in the past and that stigma of the past, but just moving forward beyond that, like what can we take away and what is, um, I believe, your goal? Like what, are, what should we be reaching for when we set the, hmm. sorry, that was like all over the place. Well, uh, I think that the, the therapeutic utility, I mean, the, the, the use of these substances to treat serious psychological conditions depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, uh, addiction, uh, when used properly with intention and, and, and set and setting and guidance and careful selection of, of, of who's doing the work and so forth, uh, that's incredibly valuable to have as a way to contribute to the relief of, of suffering in our society so much, you know, mental suffering. Uh, so that's one thing. And, and a lot of folks are, are doing that kind of work. Uh, personally, I'm most interested in how to use these tools and what's known about them to in some way deepen and expand our science of the mind. Uh, how can we kind of take a, a science of consciousness, a science of the human psyche to the next level in some way uh, to really <clears throat> expand uh, the scientific approach that we have right now to that. And I, I, I have this uh, belief that these, these uh, materials will be helpful in that endeavor. I think that will involve more of an appreciation of how to couple uh, understanding what they do uh, with the context of what we know from various spiritual traditions. And that's why one of the, <clears throat> one of the projects that uh, one of the initial project that the local UC Berkeley Center for Psychedelic Science is going to be engaged in uh, is working with, with theology students at the Graduate Theologic Union next door uh, who are well-versed in certain kinds of spiritual traditions and then see what that brings to kind of deepening the way that uh, the, the psychedelics may be able to be worked with. Because I think spiritual traditions contemplative traditions, religious traditions from all over the planet have a lot to say about the nature of mind and reality. Uh, that, that if that's integrated with a good scientific perspective on the nature of mind and reality from psychology and biology and physics and so forth, that it really may be able to, it, we may be able to take the science to the next level uh, by those kinds of collaborations. So that's my own kind of personal agenda here where I where I, I want to take things but there's this is a big space there's lots of room for all kinds of perspectives thank you for that these are great questions you guys are really really thoughtful about how you're thinking about these things If any of you saw the movie and you have any particular questions around that, I mean, I may not know the answer, but uh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you thought of it. I have never recommended that movie to a class before and then gotten any feedback on, on uh, how it was received. Yeah, I, I mean, I have, I have a question that's kind of, um, kind of related to the movie, just in how like, so <laughs> right after I watched that, that one I watched uh, Sunshine Makers, the one about Nick Sand and Tim Scully. Um, and I was just wondering how in like all of these documentaries and everything, there's like a certain way that these people are portrayed. And at least in those two movies, it seems like, at least with Timothy Leary, it's like, you know, a sort of 
uh, revolutionary philosopher, that kind of thing. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, like, with you having, having known a lot of these people, um, what in general is, was their, was their vibe like, and d do the movies do a good job of portraying that? And, um, and then compared to what the folks working in the field today are like, you know, and if, um, if that same sort of uh, larger change, uh, societal change kind of vibe persists in today's, um, today's uh, research world. Mm. If that makes sense, that was well, kind of the place. No, I, I can only say I hope so. You know, I, I, uh, I, I very much, my, my ardent hope for our future as a, as, as a species and as a society is that there will be, there will continue to be cultivated uh, momentum for really changing things in a way that will incline us, you know, one small step at a time toward the greater good you know, toward things that really benefit everyone in new and grander ways. And of course, there are many ideas on how to, how to carry some of this out. I mean, we're learning a lot from COVID right now about the inadequacies of so much of our healthcare system uh, that have, uh, that have uh, been noticed by a lot of people for a long time, but, you know, they're really in our face now, just as the whole uh, Black Lives Movement now is bringing to the surface so much systemic oppression uh, that has been around for such a long time uh, and that has been talked about by a lot of people for a long time and had its little ups and downs. But I mean, so many of us are hoping that out of this, there will be some real sustained traction uh, that leads to some real powerful beneficial change. So I can only hope that that desire to evoke, and, and that's always been the way I've felt about teaching here at, at Cal, uh, no matter what subject I was talking about, I, I always hoped that there would be some, uh, uh, some activation of some kind of desire to really change things for the better in some way uh, as we move forward in our career trajectories, whatever they are, you know, all over the place, we can do that from whatever kind of area we're working in. Uh, so I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I can only hope that this permeates all of, you know, the, the collective uh, uh, energies of the contemporary research uh, environments in all ways possible. <laughs>